Welcome to the 21st Century Watchmen, where we are covering a series entitled It's About Time. I am Trudy, and tonight I will be covering Zechariah chapters 8 through 14. Let's get started with an interesting and powerful story uh, as we conclude the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 1 through 5, the coming peace and prosperity of Zion. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine. So the, the respect that he should have, this is what he's saying, that he he's demanding these things. He's jealous because those things are not happening. And then he says, and I am jealous for her with great wrath against her enemies. So they're providing more respect for those that are their enemies than they do for the God that has actually provided and brought for them. So here God is always telling us that he is a jealous God and here is proof in his word. Thus says the Lord, I shall return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Now, here is the difference because we know that J Jerusalem had become compromised because of the way that they adapted to other customs and, and means. And, but now we're seeing that they will be a faithful city, the city of truth. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women will again sit in the streets, the public places of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of his advanced age. And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in its streets. So there's total peace and harmony that's going in here. It's kind of like being in a green belt where everybody is there and everybody is enjoying themselves. And it's the joy of seeing old age and young age together in harmony. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is difficult in the eyes of the remnants of this people in those days, in which this comes to pass, will it also be difficult in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. So if it's difficult for those people to see it, is it going to be difficult for me to see it? Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I am going to save my people from the east country and from the west. Now we remember his kingdom was north and south and that our invaders were coming from the east and the west. Okay. And I will bring them home and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth, faithfulness and in righteousness. So as we know, the children of Israel had been scattered throughout the land from the east and the west. So now he's saying that these people will come home and they're going to be his people. He's going to be their God. And this is the promise. Thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. You who in these days hear these words from the mouths of the prophets, who on the day that the fountains of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, foretell that the temple might be rebuilt. Now here we're talking about the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. We know what they said where they re came back and encouraged um, the people to continue to build the temple. For before those days, there were no wages for man or animal, nor was there any peace or success for him who went out or came in because of his enemies. For I have set all men against one another. But now in this time, since you began to build, I will not treat the remnants of this people as in the former days, declares the Lord of hosts. So there's a brand new treatment that's going to start to come. For there is seed, for there the seed will produce peace and prosperity. The vine will yield its fruit and the ground will produce its increase and the heavens will give their due. And I will cause the remnant of the people to inherit and possess all these things. So there's no more hardship that's going to happen with this, that everything is going to be, as they say, coming up daisies because they're not going to be lacking anything that would be necessary for them to be sustained. And as you have been a curse among the nations 
O house of Judah, south kingdom, and a house of Israel, the northern kingdom. So I will save you that you may be a blessing. Fear not, let your hands be strong. For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I plan to do no harm to you, when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I did not relent. So I have again planned in these days to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. We see here that God has repeatedly showed mercy and grace to the children of Israel. And he's talking about how he will continue to treat them. Right? So he said, these are the things which you should do. Speak the truth with one another. Judge with truth and pronounce the judgment that brings peace in the courts at your gates. We always know that the gates are the place where um, all business is actually conducted. All things going and coming are known there at the gates. So the gates are kind of like at the, the courts, the courts of, of reconciliation, the courts of discipline, all those things. And let none of you devise or even imagine evil in your hearts against another. And do not love lying or half truths. For all these things I hate, declares the Lord. So he's telling them that about how to regulate what they're doing and when they deal with one another, deal with one another in honesty and love, that they would be able to be right in each other's sight. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, Zachariah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month to mourn, the breaching of Jerusalem's wall, the fast of the fifth month to the mourn, the temple's destruction, the fast of the seventh month to mourn Gildalia's assassination and the fast of the 10th month to mourn the siege of Jerusalem will become times of joy and gladness and cheerful feast for the house of Judah so to bring this about love, truth, and peace. So all the previous things that had been oppressing them and keeping them down, now he's seeing that in the last portion of this is that cheerful feast will actually come to the house of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, it will come to pass that people and the inhabitants of many cities will come to Jerusalem. The inhabitants of one city will go to another saying, let us go at once to ask the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord for of hosts, I will go also. So many people and powerful nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to ask the Lord of, for his favor. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men as representatives from all the nations will grasp the robe of a Jew saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Now here it is where we look at this picture right here. It's reflective of various nations. So reminds me of the United Nations, that they're all coming from different aspects of the world, but what are they doing? They're grabbing the robe of the Jewish uh, leader because they've heard about a man and that they heard that it is true and they wanted to come and uh, to see the God that they were talking about, this God of favor. Chapter 9. Prophecies against neighboring nations. The oracle, a burdensome message of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrash in Syria with Damascus at its resting place for the eyes of men, especially of all the tribes of Israel are towards the Lord. And Hamath also whose borders on its, on its Damascus, Tyre and Sidon, though they are Though they are very wise, excuse me, for Tyre built herself an impregnable stronghold on an island offshore. And she heaped up silver like dust and gold like the mire of the streets. So he's talking about that they built this basic forge around themselves, uh, uh, something that was not easily surpassed. It kept others out. Behold, the Lord will dispose, will dispose this. Her and throw her wealth into the sea and Tyre will be devoured by fire. So what he thought that would not be subject to destruction, the Lord now is saying that he will do it and that he will destroy their wealth 
and he will burn up the property and cast it into the sea. Ashkelon will see it and fear. Gaza will writh in pain, and Akron, for her hope and expectation, has been ruined. The king will perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon will not be inhabited. Hmm, sounds real interesting, doesn't it? About where we are right now. And a Mongol race will live in Ashdod, and I will put an end to the pride and arrogance of the Philistines. I will take the blood from their mouths and their detestable things from between their teeth, those repulsive, idolatrous sacrifices eaten with the blood. We know that uh, God has always said that we're not to eat blood because the blood has life in it and we are not to uh, partake in that because we cannot give life back, okay? And then they too will be a remnant for our God and be like a clan in Judah and Akron will be like one of the Jebusites. Then I will camp around my house as a guard because of an army, because of him who passes by and returns and no oppressor will again overrun them. Israel, for now my eyes are upon them, providentially protecting them. So it's like before they may not have been in my sight but now they're in my sight and I will protect them. Then it goes on and says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king, the Hesionic king, is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, humble and unassuming in his submission to the will of the Father and riding on a donkey upon a coat, the foal of a donkey. So here he's saying that the humility of how he's coming in, he's not coming in like the great horsemen that were before that we talked about with the chariots and all the, the strong horses. But he's saying that I'm coming in lowly, meek, and mild. I will cut off the war chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of the war will be cut off, and he will speak words of peace to the nations, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea, absolutely endless, and from the river Euphrates to the ends of the earth. Salvation of Judah and Ephraim. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, my chosen people, the covenant that was sealed with blood, I have freed your prisoner from the waterless pit. Now here we hear it, here we see it here where he's calling them his chosen people. Return to the strongholds of the security and prosperity. O prisoners who have the hope, even today, I am declaring that I will restore double your former prosperity to you as firstborn among the nation. So all that you lost, that I'm going to restore them to you. And it's going to be double what you actually lost. Now here we actually have what the great horsemen look like with bold and embodied and strong horses. But here we see how Jesus described how he was going to come into the town, meek and lowly and on a foal of a donkey, which was considered a workhorse. It was not even considered uh, a, a horse of much uh, value other than servitude. For I will bend Judah as my bow, I will fit the blow with Ephraim as my arrow, and I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and will make you, Israel, like the sword of a warrior. So now we're talking about Israel having power again, having power, not to be run, because remember, they were overtaken and they were scattered into different places and chased from their land. Then the Lord will see, hovering over them, protecting his people, and his arrow will go forth like lightning, and the Lord God will blow the trumpet and will march in the windstorms of the south. The Lord of hosts shall defend and protect them, and they will devour the enemy and trample down the sling stones that have missed their marks, and they will drink of victory and be boisterous as with wine. 
and they shall be filled with sacrificial bowls used to catch the blood, drenched like the corners of the sacrificial altar. So here we're seeing that this vengeance that's going to happen, but it's, it's actually a victorious vengeance because the Lord of hosts is coming in to bring his wrath upon those that uh, have oppressed. Now here we see as they're talking about as he starts to come back, look how he came back in comparison to how he rode in lowly as on a donkey as we see here coming in just under the radar, not taking a lot of uh, credit or, or a lot of attention to himself. But then when he does return, look how he comes back. All of the strength and the thunder and the, the uh, majesty of how he is breaking through that you he's undeniable. You are definitely seeing and hearing him as he comes through. And this is where we're talking about. Let's continue. And the Lord, their God, shall save them on that day as the flock of his people, for they are like the precious jewels of a crown displayed and glittering in his land. For now, excuse me, for how great is God's goodness and how great is his beauty and how great he will make Israel's godliness and Israel's beauty. Grain and new wine will make the young men and virgins flourish. So he's talking about totally restoring them, turning over how he looked at them, that they have a renewed uh, appearance about them because they are like precious jewels in a crown. And we know that crowns represent wealth and that they all have jewels, they're bejeweled, so they have vast wealth and as well as authority that they uh, represent. 10. God will uh, bless Judah and Ephraim. As for the rain from the uh, Lord at the time of the spring rain, it is the Lord who makes the thunder clouds, and he will give them showers of rain, grass in the fields to everyone. For the teraphim, the house, household idols, speak wickedness, emptiness, worthlessness, and the diviners see lying visions and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted and suffer because there is no shepherd. Now, there is no one leading them to tell them the truth about anything. So because these people are depending on idols, they are not getting the help that they need. My anger is kindled, kindled against the shepherds who are not true shepherds. Ha, ah, look at there. And I shall punish the male goats, the leaders, for the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, and will make them like his beautiful and majestic horse in the battle. So he's saying, because they've mistreated my people, these are the things that they're going to have to pay with, and that I am going to take those people and restore them to grandeur. He's talking about, he says, his beautiful and majestic horses in battle. This is what the look at. We just looked at the horses coming in, what they look like. Here is an ancient uh, calendar, which is actually the feast of the farming years. And when we see that, the, that there are certain times that rain actually happens. So we have rain that happens in the summer months, which is called summer rains that actually happen in December, January and February. Then we have our autumn rain that actually comes between March and April. And then we have spring rains that actually come in October. So this is where I told you before that uh, they're operating on another calendar source other than the Gregorian, but uh, this is basically the uh, Hebrew calendar. So it says ancient Israel has no irrigation system and relied on rain to water their crops. In a time of drought, nothing grew. So Israel relied on both the former rain falling in autumn, and the latter rain falling in the spring. So here and actually here, these were the two most important times of rain because there were so much things going on where they were doing uh, planting and harvesting and things like that. So it had to, uh, what they had to depend on, the rain. Okay, 
From um, them, Judah shall come the cornerstone. From them, the tent peg. From them, the bow of the of battle. From them, every ruler, all of them together. They will be like mighty men trampling down their enemies in the mire of the street in the battle. And they will fight because the Lord is with them. And the enemy riders on horses will be shamed. I will strengthen the house of Judah, making it superior. And I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back and allow them to live securely because I have had compassion on them. They will be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God and I will listen and answer them. Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation measure and standard in Isaiah 28 and 16, Psalms 118, 22 to 23, Matthew 21 and 42, Acts 4 and 11, and 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. Jesus is the tent peg holding all things securely, found in Isaiah 22, 23 to 24. Jesus is the battle bow, uh, a strong fighter for good, found in Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, Revelations 19, 11 through 16. Jesus is the leader over the ruler of his people, found in Revelations 19 and 16. So there are verses to reaffirm where the word of God is. And this is what we can see is that it is made mention in various components from Old Testament to New Testament, the word of God be true. Then Ephraim will be like a mighty warrior and their hearts will rejoice as if with from wine. Now we all know that when you are rejoicing with wine, you, you feel light, you feel happy. There's no aggression. You just love everybody. Yes, their children will see it and rejoice. Their hearts will rejoice and shout triumphantly in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them together for I have redeemed them and they will increase again and they have increased before in Egypt. When I scatter them among the nations, they will remember me in far countries and with their children. They will live and come back to me uh, and the land I gave them. So what he's talking about was because of their disobedience when he uh, destroyed uh, Jerusalem and that all of the captives had to go into their captives country. So they were displaced, displaced for a very, very long time. But here God is saying that he's going to restore them from their scattered places. For this verse is a rabbinical tradition was invented that if a vulture settles on the ground and hisses, the Messiah will come immediately. It was reported to have happened once, but instead of the Messiah coming, the story went that a stone fell on the vulture's head and killed it because it was a liar. God will not allow his word to be blasphemed, even though they come up and they kind of make these things up, but God will not allow uh, his word to be defamed. Let's continue. I will bring them all Israel back home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, the land of the east and on the west of the Jordan, until no room can be found for them. And they will pass through the sea of distress and anxiety with the Lord leading his people as at the Red Sea. And he will strike the waves in the sea so that all the depths of the Nile will dry up. And the pride of Assyria will be brought down and the scepter of the taskmaster of Egypt will pass away. So we remember that the Nile is what gave Egypt its strength because they were receiving, it was a, a commerce port. So people were going in and out as they were trying to trade. So it was a through fair that people used. And this is what actually made them rich because the Nile ran through Egypt. It was their property, basically. And I will strengthen uh, Israel in the Lord, and they will walk and glory in his name, declares the Lord. In the 20th century, many Jewish people were gathered back, uh, gathered back to the land of Israel, and in 1948, Israel became a nation again. After more than 2,000 years of not being a nation, does the 20th century gathering of Israel fulfill this prophecy? It fulfills it in part, but only in part, because Israel will be gathered again in belief, not in rejection of the Lord and his Savior, 
the gathering began in unbelief, but will end up in belief and trust in God. So the things that we are seeing, we we notice what's going on right now over in Israel. And people often ask, oh, is the Lord coming back? But we see there are certain pieces that have to be in place that would signify his immediate coming. This is according to his word. Right? So chapter 11. Open your doors, O Lebanon. The fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen because the magnificent trees have been destroyed. Wail, O oak of Bashan, for the inaccessible forest on the steep mountain side has come down. So all of the impenetrable things have actually been devoured by something else that man could not take down the cedars, but fire could ravish it. There is a sound of the shepherd's wail, for their splendor grazing land is ruined. There is a sound of the young lion's roar, for the pride of Jordan is ruined. Thus says the Lord my God, pasture the flock doomed for slaughter, whose buyers slay them and go unpunished, and those who sell them uh, say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, for I have become rich, and their own shepherds have no pity on them, nor protect them from the wolves. And we see here a shepherd is actually one that is supposed to at all costs protect the flock. So we see there's a transition that's happening here. For I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. But behold, I will cause the men to fall, each into the hands of another and into the hands of his foreign king. So I'm going to allow you to be captured. And the enemy will strike the land and will not rescue the people from their hand. So I, Zechariah, pastured the flock, the flock doomed for slaughter, truly as the name implies, the most miserable of sheep. And I took two shepherd's staffs, the one I called favor or grace, and the other one I called union or bond. So I pastured the flock. Now here in this particular uh, version, they called it gnome and help. Hobalum, Hobalum, okay? Gnome would have been grace and Nobalum would have been uh, bonds. Then I eliminated the three incompetent, unfit shepherds, the civil rulers, the priests, and the prophets. So all those that were not following God's rules and, and responsibilities, Ze uh, Zachariah is now saying, then I eliminated the three. And these are three pivotal point, uh, people that are in these places. We have a civil ruler, which would be like your kings and queens and things like that. Your priests, the one that has been are called by God, and then the prophets that are also placed by God. So these three factions, which should have been communicating uh, the truth, were out of alignment. So you're saying that they were going to be eliminated. So I said, I will not pasture you. What is to die, let it die. And what is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let the survivors devour one's flesh. So I'll leave you to your own vices. I took my staff, favor, and broke it in pieces, breaking the covenant which I had made with all the people. So the covenant was broken on that day. And thus, the most wretched of the flock who were watching me realized that it was the word of the Lord. I said to them, it seems good to you. Give me your wages. But if not, do not. So they weighed out 30 pieces of silver as my wages. And there's something about those 30 pieces of silver. We had the same thing with uh, Judas Iscariot that he sold out Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter as if to, uh, to the dogs. The magnificent sum at which I am valued by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> it's like, what an insult. Then I broke my second staff, union, into pieces to break the brotherhood between Judah, the southern kingdom, and Israel, the northern kingdom. The Lord said to me, Take again for yourself the equipment of the shepherd, but this time of a foolish shepherd. 
For behold, I am going to raise up a false shepherd in the land who will not care for the perishing, seek the scattered, heal the broken, or feed the healthy, but will eat the flesh of the fat ones and tear off the hoofs to consume everything. He said, I sent you, you will not, but I'm going to send you something 10 times worse for you to deal with. Woe, judgment is coming to the worthless and foolish shepherd who deserts the flock. The sword will strike his arms and his right eye. His arm shall be totally withered and his right arm completely blinded. So I'm going to cripple you. You won't be able because when you actually affect different parts of people, you, you affect their whole uh, being of who they are. Let's continue. Jesus uh, to be attacked. The oracle, a burdensome message of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of the man within him. Behold, I'm going to make Israel, excuse me, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling and staggering, being a cup that's going to make you feel like you're drunk to all the surrounding people. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. So they were not getting away. And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the people. All who lift it will be severely injured. And all the nations of the earth will come and be gathered against it. In that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But I will open my eyes and watch over the house of Judah and will strike every horse of the opposing nation with blindness. So here he's talking about there's nothing worse than an uncontrollable horse. So if a horse gets spooky, he's very dangerous because he is continuing to run out of fear and he will run through and run over people. So people will become harmed and um, with that, with a runaway horse. So, and then he's talking about the rider is going to be taken to madness. So he won't be able to control the horse. So it's a calamity waiting to happen. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are a strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile. So we're going to put some heat up on you. And I like a flaming torch among sheaves of grain. They will devour all the surrounding people on the right hand and on the left. And the people of Jerusalem will again live securely in their own place in Jerusalem. So uh, here we see God's intention is always to restore Jerusalem. If we cannot know anything else as we look at what's going on, that God's will is to restore Jerusalem. The Lord shall save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the people of Jerusalem and the one who is impaired among them in that day of persecution will become strong and noble like David and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord who is before them. And in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace, unmerited favor, and supplication. And they will look at me, whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And they will weep bitterly over him as one who weeps bitterly over his firstborn. Now, what they were saying is that those Jews that came before did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So then he's going to show them the piercings, the piercings in his hands and in his feet, that it is him. And then they're going to bitterly mourn that they did not realize what they had before them at that time. In the day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of the city of Hadadramon in the city of Megiddo over beloved King Josiah. So what's going to happen is that there's going to be a huge uh, repentance that's going on with, with, with crying and mourning and things like that. 
The land will mourn every family by itself, the royal family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan, David's son, by itself, and the wives by themselves. Okay. The priestly family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves. The family of Shem Shemai, grandson of Levi, by itself and their wives by itself. All the families that remain, each by itself and their wives by themselves, each with an overwhelming individual regret for having blindly rejected the Messiah. So this is great grief that as they realize and they see him in his return, that they rejected him and they are wholeheartedly ashamed. 13. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the people of Jerusalem for cleansing from sin and impurity. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and they will no longer be remembered. I will also remove the false prophets and the unclean spirits from the land. So we see here that the Lord is coming through doing a clean sweep of everything. Everything that it caused his children to stumble after he has restored them and allowed them to come and regret and repent that he's going to remove every obstacle that would cause them to fall. And if anyone still appears as a prophet and falsely prophesies, then his father and mother who gave birth to him will say to him, you shall not live for you have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother who gave birth to him shall pierce him through when he prophesies. See there? Tables are turning when they uh, pierced him for prophesying and telling about this is what's going to happen now. And in that day, the false prophets will each be ashamed uh, of his visions when he prophesies. And they will not wear a hairy robe of the true prophet in order to deceive. Now we remember that and Jacob, how he uh, fooled his father because he put on the hairy robe, how he's feeling. So this is what that reference is made to. But he will deny his identity, say, I am no prophet. I work for the ground because a man sold me as a slave in my youth. And one will say to him, what are the, these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, these, those wounds I received in the house of my friends. Now see. Those wounds you get run up through. A wake on sword against my shepherd and against the man, my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd so that the sheep of the flock may be scattered. And I will, and I will turn my hand and stretch it out against the little ones of the flock. I will come about in all the land, declares the Lord. Two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left alive. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will listen and answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. So here again, he's talking about the remnant that he's bringing through. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you, Jerusalem, will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, and the houses plundered, and the women ravished, and half of the city will be exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his Feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will split in half from the east to the west by a very large valley, and half of the mountain will come towards the north, and half of it will come towards the south. So we see here in this diagram that it says that as soon as his feet hit here on the Mount of Olives, sits on Zion, that he will cause a great earthquake that will cause this, um, this, this great division that is going to cause a great separation, that when he comes back, you will flee by the valley of my mountains. So 
for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel, and you will flee just as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Ezai, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones, believers and angels will come with him. What a glorious day. And in that day, there will be no light. The glorious one and heavenly bodies shall be darkened, but it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, not day and not night, but an evening time, there will be light. In And in that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the Eastern Sea, the Dead Sea, and half of them to the Western Sea, the Mediterranean, and it will be in summer as well as in winter. So the water will flow. It will not stop because here before we talked about that they didn't have an irrigation system. But now he's talking about this living water will continue to flow. Here's an example of the day of the Lord. And he was saying that there's neither night nor day, but in the evening that the, the uh, there will be illumination. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord shall be the only one worshipped, and his name uh, the only one. All the land will be changed into, into a plain from Geba to Rimon, and the Rimon that is south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain lifted up on its site from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate, to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hanal to the king's wine press. It will be inhabited, for there will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Now this will be the plague with which the Lord shall strike all the people that have warred against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouth. Now, when, when that happens, that type of plague that comes, that, that has to be instantaneous. So it is something that will come very quickly that's going to overtake them because they will rot right where they're standing while they're standing on their feet. So their flesh will rot. So that could either be something like, uh, as they speculate, some type of nuclear thing that will make your uh, flesh rot. Who knows? But that's just um, one of the assumptions. Okay, so here's a, a map of all the places that they kind of called out. The uh, Benjamin's Gate, the Corner Gate, the Tower of Hanau. Um, there are a bunch of other places in here too. But all of these places are going to be subjugated to uh, what he talked about. And, and that all the land that it will be changed into a plain. And that everything that it says, but Jerusalem will rise and remain lifted up on its sites from the uh, Benjamin's gate. So this is a layout of the uh, temple. In that day, a great panic and dismay from the Lord will fall on them and they will seize one another's hands and the hands of one will be raised against the hands of the other. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered together, gold and silver and garments in great abundance. So like this plague on men, there will be a plague on the horses, the mules, the camels, the donkeys, and all the livestock in those camps. And everyone who is left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and celebrate the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And it will be that whichever of the families on the of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain for them. So there will be punishment if you don't go and give your reverence and respect. Now here's a calendar of the feast of the Lord as they start to talk about. We have Passover, which uh, actually, uh, and, and Pentecost. So we say there's a 50 day span that when we start off from the first fruits through uh, the Feast of Pentecost, there's a 50 day span here, okay? And then when we look at what we're looking at, the Feast of Tabernacles, and it actually 
is an eight day course that they actually uh, celebrate. I thought this calendar would be something very interesting for us to have as a reference to go back and actually look at all of the different timing of year that uh, these things are actually held in and to understand what, what the uh, Feast of the Lords actually are. If the family of Egypt go, does not go up to Jerusalem and presents themselves, then no rain will fall on them. It will be a plague with which the Lord will strike the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. This will be the consequent punishment for the sin of Egypt and the consequent punishment for the sins of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths, Tabernacles. In that day, there will be written on the little bells on the horses, holy to the Lord, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be holy to the Lord, like the bowls before the altar. So everything is going to be uniform. There's not going to be a mistake of who and what is going on. Every cooking pot in all the houses in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts. And all who sacrifice will come and take them and boil their sacrifices in them. And in that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite, that is, any godless or spiritually unclean person, whether Jew or Gentile, in the house of the Lord of hosts. So he's making us all clean. He's, he's purifying us. He's giving the pots that, that belong to him, that everything that we do will be unto him. They're not our pots. They're his pots. Okay. Here we got to a very critical part of our lesson, our uh, salvation prayer. We cannot make it without the salvation of Christ. If you do not know him in the partner of your sin, I admonish you to do it today. For as we can see the events as they are actually winding up, it lets us know that time is closer than it was before. So let's make sure that you are in the safety zone. You are in his arms, that you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior. And if you haven't, today is a great day. If you repeat after me, Father, it is written in your word that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart, that you have raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. Therefore, Father, I confess that Jesus is my Lord. I make him Lord of my life right now. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I renounce my past life with Satan and close the doors to any of his devices. I thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Jesus is my Lord and I am a new creation. Old things have passed away, and all things become new. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you've repeated that prayer with me, welcome to the body of Christ. It is just that it is the confession of your faith that he looks for, that you state that you believe in him. Maybe you found yourself in uh, the scriptures, and you have to repent. God is calling us all to repent, because without his grace and mercy, we would not be here so we constantly need to renew our, our, our repentance to him. So if that's you, God bless you. There's one more thing that I would love for you to do, that if you have accepted Christ today, that you will put your name in the chat and where you're coming from so that we can make sure that we help you successfully migrate in your new journey, that we can get you connected with Bible-based church. We have members all across the nation. And we just want to make sure that we ensure your success, that your successful walk with Christ is one that flourishes and that you grow in grace. And before you go, make sure you like and subscribe this channel. Um, this helps us get out the Bible story and the Bible um, where it's more tangible, where we're giving examples and, and we're helping you read along so that there's a better understanding of the word of God. And, and this is what we have uh, vowed to do. We are the 21st Century Watchmen, where we have been going through the Bible chronologically in a one-year time period. And we have been giving a word every day, every single day. And uh, this word is so that it goes out and it can be shared with others, that others will hear the gospel and be able to be saved. You know, it's hearing the word, be hearers of the word. And once we become hearers of the words, become doers of the words, 
This is what the, the Bible tells us to do. So God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Make sure you're here tomorrow again at 6 o'clock for It's About Time, where we are the 21st Century Watchmen. God bless you all.